Your work is developed in an interdisciplinary field that involves chemistry, physics, biology, and ha have given rise a new chemistry that allows to produce rotaxans, molecular switches, and molecular machines. But I think that Professor Sauvage's figure today also symbolizes the importance of science in society. Science is recognized as the most effective and perhaps the only vehicle for social, economic, and welfare progress. There is no future social advance of technology without science. Both basics or applied science are important and somehow impossible to differentiate, and I think this is clear in your work that you are going to present today. As an exponent of this excellent research are in the University of Seville or different schools, present here, here today, the School of Physics, Biology, and I will refer particularly to the School of Chemistry, in which Professor Sauvage has a main focus. The School of Chemistry has a long tradition from was funded more than 100 years ago in 1909, and today has a, a, a strong structure uh, internationally recognized with undergraduate, graduate, and doctorate programs. The School of Chemistry range in the Shanghai subject and ranking of Shanghai sub for subject, ranking between 200 and 400, depending on the year and it produced, has produced in the last five years more than 1,000 papers ranked in Q1. And most of his publications, are the, uh, they become uh, from international collaboration. So this is really an exceptional school as uh, others that we have in the university. In addition to that, out of the three mixed centers that we have with the Spanish National Lab with the SIG. Three of them are dedicated uh, focus on chemistry. Three of them are in the Cartuja Research Center, the Institute of Chemical Research, the Institute of Plant Biochemistry and Photosynthesis, and the Institute of Material. We are pushing really hard in the University of Seville. So these mixed centers, the institute, the departments, the centers can work in an ecosystem where they have talent attraction, uh, we push for the technology transfer. We have been getting uh, around 40 million of uh, in scientific infrastructure in the last few years. So they, uh, we can push and we can create a research of excellence. I hope you can get the same perception during your visit that I'm giving you today. And you leave our town thinking that Sevilla is a good place for science. Well, now we are eager to listen to your lecture. First, we are going to have the presentation from the director of Cartuja Scientific Research Centers. I just want to finish wishing you a productive uh, visit, also pleasant, in our, our five times centenary university that we really will wish that after today, today you think that is also your own university. Thank you very much. And now, Professor Javier Rojo. Good morning, everyone. So, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the University of Seville, and in particular, uh, his uh, Vice President of Research, Julian Martinez, for this kind invitation and also to provide this incredible place. It's a fantastic room to have this conference today here in the University of Seville. Uh, first of all, uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to me to introduce our speaker. I have to say that uh, I'm going to introduce a very relevant chemist in the world but also I have to introduce a friend, so which is make this task a little bit complicated. So Jean-Pierre Sauvage uh, is now at the Supramolecular Science and Engineering Institute, the ICS in Strasbourg in France. He is an emeritus professor of the University of Strasbourg and also is emeritus research director of the CNRS, so it's the equivalent of the CSIC in, in, in Spain. Uh, fortunately, uh, there are places like ICS in, in France to host top scientists 
without limitation due to their age. In fact, in ISIS, now are working Professor Martin Karplus, Professor Jean-Marie Len, and Professor Jean-Pierre Sobas, three Nobel laureates in chemistry. And I think this is a real privilege, and unfortunately, we're still a little bit far away of this situation, but uh, hopefully we are in the road in the next years. I try to summarize a life of research in a few minutes. It's an easy task because he is a very well known, but at the, ten, at the same time, it's difficult to sum up all the relevant contributions he has done during all these years. So, Professor Sobas was attracted by chemistry in his early job. He graduated at the Chemical Engineering School of Strasbourg. This is one of the top uh, places to do chemistry in, in his country. And after that, he decided to do a PhD thesis in a newly created lab at the Institute level in Strasbourg. That lab was directed by a young, brilliant scientist, Professor Jean-Marie Len, that later on was awarded with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1987. During this period, Professor Sovas was involved in the preparation of microbicycle compounds, the famous cryptans, with the capacity to encapsulate cations or ions in general, the crack tapes. One of the first milestones in his career that settled the early basis of the nascent field that was coined a supramolecular chemistry, the chemistry beyond the molecule. After the PhD, Professor Soba moved uh, to one of the reference labs in organometallic chemistry, the lab of Professor Marco Green in Oxford University. With this training in coordination chemistry, organometallics, and the synthesis of microcycles, he returned to Strasbourg to join again the group of Professor Lem. At that time was the famous crisis of, the, of oil all around the world, and he was involved in the preparation of systems capable to photochemical split water producing hydrogen that was considered an important source of green fuel. Hot topic of research that is still today remains as a priority. In 1980, he was uh, promoted to the CNRS uh, director, research director, and started his independent career. He was completely fascinated by challenging topological complex molecules and have the capacity to do easy, what is very complicated. He prepared uh, the famous interlock ring compounds and he addressed the synthesis of these uh, elusive uh, compounds using a very smart strategy with metal complexes as templates to facilitate the ring closure. In this way, at the beginning of the 80s, his group created the first catenine and opened a new field. The synthesis of more complex uh, structures were achieved uh, until the preparation in 1989 of the famous trifold knot. It was the first synthesis of a knot, a very complex and elusive chemical architecture, and a relevant milestone in this field now known as the chemical topology, where uh, Professor Sobas is a real pioneer. This research quickly evolved to create motion in molecules and this motion could be controlled at the molecular level and could be reversible. And that was the first step with very simple molecules of the creation of molecular motors or nanomachines. These compounds or these uh, structures were inspired by nature, tried to mimic the function of that biomolecules that do important works in, in living organisms. This research opened the door for a development of a new field that inspired many scientists all around the world. Professor Sobas has received, as you can imagine, numerous awards and distinctions, but uh, probably all of you know that in 2016, together with Sir Fraser Stoddard and Ben Feringia, he received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016. And that was due to the contribution in the design of the synthesis of molecular machines. So today, Professor Jean-Pierre Sobal will deliver a conference entitled Interlocking Rings at the Molecular Level Machines and Motors. Thank you so much to be here. It's a real pleasure and we are all excited to hear your conference. Thank you. So, good morning everybody. Uh, although it's um, 12.15. Uh, let's call it a morning. 
so it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to be offered the opportunity to lecture uh, in an absolutely magnificent uh, place, magnificent room. And I would like to thank the university, the rector of the university and the vice president for research. Thank you, Julian. Uh, also, thank you, Javier, for your uh, kind uh, presentation. Um, I should say that uh, we know each other since uh, 1995, if I'm correct. And uh, although we know each other for many years, he's a young man, you know, he could basically be my son. Uh, so, um, I hope that, uh, I hope that um, you have some notions of chemistry, at least for um, a certain number uh, of you. And uh, I will talk about uh, several fields in which our group has been involved um, related to um, catenase, so interlocking rings, and uh, other species um, towards uh, molecular machines and molecular motors. So the very beginning, uh, this is an important publication uh, which appeared in uh, the American journal, uh, JAX, in 1961. And it is very simply entitled Chemical Topology. Chemical, we all understand. I mean, chemistry, chemical. Topology, this is much more difficult to understand. Topology, it's a branch of mathematics uh, which has nothing to do with geometry. Uh, and basically, at the time when it was published, uh, it meant that some molecules cannot be represented in a plane on a sheet of paper uh, without crossings. So we take a ring here, the ring as a planar graph, planar because you can put it in a plane, you can uh, embed it in a two-dimensional space without crossings, very easy. But the same ring, or let's say the same sequence of atoms and chemical bonds uh, can be arranged in a, in a different way so that if you have a species like that with exactly the same chemical uh, formula as the ring. Now you have a knotted ring, and this knotted ring, ring cannot be represented in a plane without crossings, three crossings. And this would be the trefal knot, a very famous uh, uh, topology discussed by mathematicians since uh, the end of the, the 19th century. And in the same way, uh, here you have of course, a planar graph, because you can draw those species in, a, in your sheet of paper without crossings. But if you interlock them, uh, you will obtain a new species, and you will need two crossings if you want to represent this molecule, let's say, in a plane. So that was the beginning of uh, chemical topology. And so the people, in a way, um, long, long before this paper, had been dreaming of catenanes. So this is a catenane, a two-catenane, because it consists of two interlocking rings. And those molecules were, of course, they appeared as very attractive species, uh, but it was impossible to make them, at least uh, from a practical viewpoint. And so, at the beginning of the, the 20th century, there were already discussions about uh, making such species, but uh, without any, any success. And the first remarkable um, piece of work in this field uh, was published many years ago in 1964 uh, by two German chemists, Professor Gottfried Schill and his boss of the time, Professor Arthur uh, Lüttringhaus. And the work was done not far from Strasbourg, in uh, Freiburg, in Breisgau, in Germany, maybe 70 kilometers uh, southeast of my city. And these people could show that uh, you can make a catenane uh, using very, very 
tedious, uh, um, a very tedious approach uh, with many, many individual chemical steps, namely 23 chemical steps, but you can make it. And they probably obtained um, one milligram of it. Um, the people at the time were very impressed by the piece of work, but it seemed to be so difficult that nobody tried to repeat it. So for 20 years, catenanes were more objects for discussions than anything else, and something had to happen. And now I will discuss you the something which happened. So when we were, when we entered the field, in fact, we were very much interested in um, photochemistry, in photocatalysis, in um, energy uh, storage problems, like uh, trying to split the water molecules. And the hero of the time was ruthenium trees by pyridine. So this nice looking molecule uh, with a ruthenium center and three small organic molecules interacting with the ruthenium center. And there were lots of papers devoted to this um, a nice uh, transition metal complex, and things haven't changed. This is still the hero in photocatalysis and uh, solar energy research. And but when we started um, our group, we thought that um, there is a weak point. Ruthenium, it's a noble metal, very expensive, uh, or similar to platinum or gold, very rare, and so uh, if we could change the situation and find something which is more accessible and cheaper, uh, it would certainly be beneficial to the field. And so when, uh, as I said, when we, we started our group uh, at the very beginning, uh, we thought that it would be nice to replace ruthenium for copper, copper being basically cheap, you know, very cheap, uh, almost free. And we started a collaboration with uh, a chemist, or photophysicist, I should say, David Macmillan. And David Macmillan uh, visited Strasbourg. He was on sabbatical leave. And we interacting very, very strongly. And at the time, we had made a simple molecule, which was new before we made it, uh, which is this compound. And we discussed extensively, and, uh, and David Macmillan told us, well, we will collaborate. You will make the copper complex of this molecule, and we will do all the photophysics. And we said, OK, let's do that to get together. So a very simple reaction. Something happened. And, and so the, we discussed and we made the molecule, uh, which uh, the reaction is reported here. So we take this compound. The two nitrogen atoms of the molecule allow it to interact with the transition metal, and we generate a new species. This is a copper complex with two entwined ligands. So this uh, fragment here is called a ligand. We have two entwined ligands, interacting ligands, and we did a lot of photochemistry, a lot of photophysics, and everything was nice. Uh, life was pleasant. But we noticed something, something very special. Now, looking at the molecule, looking at the growing, we noticed that if we connect this point to the, the other point, which is here, we make a ring which is in a vertical plane. And separately, uh, if we look at the horizontal fragment, if we interconnect this point and this other point, we will make a ring in a horizontal plane. Very simple. And how are these rings? These rings are interlocking with one another. For the moment, it's purely hypothetical. But if we make a ring here, another ring here, 
And if we move the copper center, those two rings will be interlocking, no doubt. And so we thought, well, we have some nice trick to make a catenane, and nobody had made catenanes in a <coughs> satisfactory fashion. Uh, should we start in a new field, in an almost virgin field? And we thought, yes, let's forget about inorganic photochemistry, and let's try to make a catenane. And it was very fast. Within one year, with a, a fantastic organic chemist, Christian Dietrich Buschecker, a good friend at the same time, uh, we had our first paper on the making of a catenane using um, a copper precursor, which was at the same time a photocatalyst. So we published in a reasonably good journal, not a high impact journal because at the time, there were no high-impact journals. There were just good and less good journals. And on top of that, we published in French. So that was kind of um, unusual. Uh, the principle is represented here, very simple. Uh, you take your two ligands, your two uh, uh, molecules, very similar to what we have seen before. You interact with a transition metal, namely copper one, and you ge generate this intermediate. And from this intermediate, it's very simple. You will make a ring on the right using a GG fragment. You will make another ring on the left using the same GG fragment. And at the end of the day, you obtain your catenary. This is extremely simple, um, very naive in a way. And so I have a video which probably uh, illustrates in a more uh, modern and uh, uh, easier to understand um, way, uh, the reaction, the principle. So we start from this, uh, which is this very simple molecule. We can make grams of it if we like. And now we interact it with copper. So copper will arrive. We make the entwined species. We prepare a ring on the right part we close the ring on the left part, and here we are, we have a catenary. Very simple. And the other strategy is a little bit more complex, but not so much. Uh, we start from a pre-synthetized ring with exactly the same fragment here, two nitrogen atoms ready to interact with copper. We mix with copper, we add an additional fragment, and finally we close and we also obtain a catenary. It is slightly longer. Uh, we have an additional step, but it can be even more efficient, especially if you want to make um, desymmetrical systems. So we could grow crystals of these molecules, and again, this is the very, very beginning. Uh, here we have the X-ray structure of the copper complex catenane and uh, we can demetallate, this is quantitative, we can even remetallate if we like, and uh, this is the X-ray structure of the metal-free molecule. And if you look carefully, you will notice that the geometries are very different. The geometry of the copper uh, complex species is um, very compact, and the geometry of the metal-free species it's very open. Everything can move. <coughs> so now let me pay homage to the people who have been working in the field of catenanes and rotaxanes. Uh, there were discussions, uh, as I said, at the very beginning, uh, in the 60s, at the beginning of the 60s, mostly by Ed Wasserman. Uh, Schill and Lüttringhaus, they published a very beautiful piece of work in 1964, uh, but uh, its impact was limited because of uh, the number of chemical steps needed for making the molecule. Our work uh, was done at the beginning of the 80s, and then it was followed by a beautiful work by some other organic chemists, uh, Fraser Stoddart, uh, Chris Hunter, Fritz Fuckley, and they were using organic templates. Uh, Fujita 
published a beautiful piece of work based on palladium, uh, and uh, Professor Ogino uh, reported the first convincing procedure for making a hot axis. So a ring threaded by an axis and two big stoppers being attached at both ends of the axis. That was the very beginning. So now let me show you that um, we were also very much interested in chemical topology uh, and we moved towards more complex topology. So this is mostly a challenge to make complex topologies with molecules and uh, of course it's not only the synthetic challenge but it is also related to the, to the discovery of new chemical or physical properties. If you have a new molecular system you may expect to find new properties. And we will talk, we will spend a couple of minutes on the trefal knot uh, because this is really, it was at the time a real challenge trying to make a trefal knot, a knotted molecule. So one ring, but a knotted ring. <coughs> so the strategy we applied was derived from the strategy we had used for making a catenane. So this is what I just, just spoke about. Two organic fragments, uh, a system containing two entwined ligands, and then by cyclizing here and here, here and here, formation of a catenary. Now we will just make it a little bit more complex um, and use a, a molecular string, so to say, which contains two units, here and here, able to interact with the transition metal. So we start from here, we mix with two copper ions, and we generate a double uh, um, helical uh, species. Uh, so it's a double helix, in a way. And now, if we cyclize, go from here to here, and from here to here, we generate this species, and this species is a trifle knot. If you remove the two copper, the two ions, you can even represent it in another way, like that, and this is the same trifle knot. The geometry, of course, is very different from this and that, but the topology is exactly the same. You need three crossings if you want to represent it in a plane. So let's embark in the synthesis. So we start from this compound with a small uh, CH24 linker between the two chelating groups. We mix with copper, uh, with the, the proper stoichiometry, and we obtain this intermediate, very similar to the drawing we have seen before. And now you see you have two phenols uh, going up here and two phenolic functions going down, and we will cyclize. Very simple. So we cyclize. Um, we use a, let's say, <coughs> a very efficient methodology which was developed uh, uh, some time ago. Uh, so we use hexaethylene glycol. It's a derivative, the iodo derivative, and cesium carbonate as base. And we interconnect these two points and separately these two points. And we obtain sorry, we obtain the trefal knot. The yield at the beginning was miserable, but we improved it enormously uh, over the years, and I just show you the beginning. Uh, we could even have an X-ray structure of the compound, which was, um, of course, a great pleasure uh, to see the molecule, to visualize the molecule. And this is exactly what we had expected. The two copper ions are here, uh, it's only one ring, uh, one ring because uh, you can travel all along the, the curve here and you will come back to the starting point. It's one ring. It is, of course, chiral and uh, we could crystallize, uh, um, we could obtain both enantiomers because the system under undergoes spontaneous resolution. If you crystallize the molecule, you pick up a crystal and it contains only one enantiomer. This is called alapaster, you know, the, the, 
really separate uh, enantiomers. Uh, we could also demetallate. So if you remove the two copper ions, you obtain a completely new species, which is the metal-free knot. And the metal-free knot has very strange properties um, because it undergoes some kind of slow reptation uh, motion, uh, similarly to what has been described by uh, Degene, Pierre-Gilles Degene, um, a Nobel Prize laureate in physics, a French, French uh, scientist, uh, in polymers, you know, uh, molecules uh, rotating slowly like snakes. Um, and this molecule undergoes exactly the same type of motion, which is very novel. Uh, no way you can take NMR. No, it's uh, always rotating and gliding uh, very, very slowly. But this is when we use uh, cyanide, which is associated to tetraethyl ammonium. And this cyanide, which is, you know, uh, able to pick up copper, to avidly bind copper, uh, can be replaced for another cyanide. And so one day we used potassium cyanide. And that was a very good idea. Totally, you know, uh, uh, non predicted by us. But if we use potassium cyanide, we observe a very strange phenomenon. I think a very interesting phenomenon. Potassium is able to interact with OCH2, CH2O fragments. For those who are chemists, you know that crown eaters, which were created 50 years ago, crown eaters contain OCH2, CH2O fragments, and they are able to interact with potassium or sodium ions or other uh, alkali and alkaline metal uh, uh, earth um, uh, metal uh, ions. And um, so potassium will interact with this part of the molecule, the OCH2, CH2O fragments, and copper uh, will, uh, will be kicked out so that you completely invert the molecule. What was it at the outside first? before the reaction with potassium cyanide becomes inside, it will become the internal part of the molecule, and you have two potassium ions interacting with the OCH2, CH2O fragments, similarly to crown eaters, and the two phenanthrolines are now lying at the back. And you can completely invert the process. If you had copper, you will go back to this shape. The outside is now uh, internal, and the internal part have now been pushed um, to the outside, to the periphery. So this is a, a strange uh, a molecule in this respect, and I don't know any other molecular system uh, doing uh, something similar. So this is the uh, copper complex, and this is the potassium ion complex. <coughs> Just to show you that topology um, is a very exciting field in mathematics, uh, in chemistry, although uh, the chemical approach of, of topology today is quite naive, but in biology it is also very, very important. And catenanes and knots are very, very common in nature. They are everywhere, uh, from proteins to DNA to viruses, and this is also some kind of motivation for chemists uh, to make molecular systems which, to some extent, uh, resemble uh, biological objects. And so you have trefoil knots here built on a circular duplex DNA, uh, beautiful uh, micrographs of those species. Of course, the scale is not the same. We are in the uh, micron uh, scale. Uh, we are not in the, in the nanometer uh, scale, um, but these species are very exciting and very important. Uh, another one which I like, um, so the, the white head link is um, another very exciting topology which has not been made until uh, uh, very recently. Uh, it's a five-crossing catenane. 
So you have uh, two rings, but they are arranged in a very special way. And if you look at some DNA, DNA uh, can also be arranged as the, the wide head link, this five crossing catenary. And um, another comment, um, the people, let's say 10 years ago, uh, the people didn't imagine that proteins can be knotted, that uh, knotted proteins can be important. But some people looked at the, the data, data banks, you know, the protein um, data bank, and they found that one person, even a little bit more than one person, of all the proteins known and crystallized are knots. They are trifle knots. Uh, and that was a big surprise to many people. They are trifle knots, and the fact that they are knotted is not an accident. This is completely functional. When a protein wants to rigidify its uh, reaction site, uh, it makes a knot. And so everything is more rigid, and it will be more difficult for the protein to, for the protein, uh, to be denatured. So that's, I think, very, very exciting. And probably the most beautiful uh, uh, topological uh, object of nature is a virus. HK97 uh, uh, virus. Well, I'm not sure we are allowed to talk of viruses uh, these days, uh, but I take the risk. Um, it's not a nasty virus. It's a bacteriophage virus. You know, it will invade bacteria and mix its DNA with uh, the, the bacterium uh, uh, DNA. Uh, it's um, not so different from other structures. Uh, something like uh, 60 nanometers um, large uh, um, sphere. It's close to a sphere. It's a truncated icosahedron, like many uh, viruses. And if you look carefully at the membrane, uh, the membrane is a natural chain mail. A chain mail, uh, in French we say Côte de Maille, and in Spanish, I don't know. So you see, you see what it is. I mean, like what the knights, you know, used, used to put on to protect their bodies. And so that you have five, you have octagons, pentagons, octagons, pentagons everywhere. And so the virus now is uh, mechanically very robust, uh, but it is very flexible. And being very flexible, it can pass barrier very easily. This is the trick. Now let's move on towards uh, molecular machines. And um, I have a comment, you know, something which is very general. If you look at synthetic molecules and also at many biological molecules, uh, they are considered as uh, motionless objects, static objects. Uh, although they can move, they can uh, distort, they can vibrate, uh, but their motions are not controlled. So they undergo motion in a stochastic way, in a random way, and there were very, very few molecular systems for which motion uh, can be triggered and controlled. In biology now, in biology it is totally different. And there is a family of, pro of uh, proteins called the motor proteins, uh, which are moving all the time uh, moving in a strictly controlled fashion and for some reason, you know, if they move, it is because they have a purpose which is to fulfill a function. And for instance, you can find rotary motors, uh, linear motors, walkers, we will see an example very briefly, uh, molecular systems which can uh, contract or expand, um, etc. So let me just uh, mention two especially uh, spectacular uh, examples, uh, one which is ATP synthase. So I think no need to discuss too much uh, ATP synthase. Uh, you know that uh, uh, ATP, you know, the, the fuel of life, uh, is made by ATP synthase from ADP, the, the de degradation product of ATP, and uh, inorganic phosphate, 
And uh, there is a machinery for making ATP, which is ATP synthase, which is basically the same machinery uh, for uh, the most primitive organisms, uh, which appeared on Earth uh, more than three billion years ago, and uh, mammals and human beings, uh, and it's a rotary motor. And we will see another example of a walker. So it's a video you find on the net, which is really beautiful, but it's not science fiction, and I would like to insist on that. It's a video which is based on scientific data. Uh, biologists have studied in detail, you know, really in detail. There are hundreds or thousands of publications on ATP synthase and the way it functions. And ATP synthase, which is represented here, is embedded in the, in the membrane of the mitochondria <coughs> and it functions as a rotary motor. <coughs> so this part rotates and you have a shaft of an axis threaded inside a cluster of six proteins and by moving this part, by rotating this part, uh, ATP is uh, generated from ADP, which is yellow, an inorganic phosphate, and ATP, the purple species, is, is synthetized. This is fantastic. I should say that it rotates much, much faster than on the video. Uh, it's uh, several thousand rounds per minute, um, and it's a beautiful rotary motor. You know, chemists, of course, dreamt when they saw such system. And there is another video which is very famous, uh, which was prepared by biologists uh, at Harvard University in the US. Uh, this is the kinesin uh, walking on a uh, microtubule, and the kinesin is transporting a matter, uh, molecules, made somewhere in the, in the cell uh, to some other pla place where the molecules are needed. So they can be proteins, um, fragments of DNA, and many, many uh, various uh, molecular systems. And uh, so I, I hear that my lecture triggers a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this is the kinesin, and uh, the kinesin uh, has attached at its back a big, a big bag of uh, molecules which are, which are transported over a very large uh, distance. So now, what about uh, molecular machines in chemistry? Uh, the first question we can ask is, what is the connection between what you spoke about before, cationanes, NOTs, rataxanes, and molecular machines? The, the connection is very direct, because you can very easily figure out that if you have cationanes, uh, such a, as a very simple uh, rotaxane here, or catenanes. Uh, if you take a two rotaxane, uh, and if you can move the ring, the red ring, from the left side of the axis to the right side, and go back, what are you doing? You have a linear motor, exactly like a piston moving in a cylinder. Uh, you have a linear motor. So let's keep that in mind. If you can rotate the red ring here uh, around the blue axis, or if you can rotate the, the red uh, ring here uh, within the, the blue ring here, uh, you are making a rotary motor, some, something which is very close to a rotary motor. So clearly, these rotaxanes are catenanes will be the components of complex, more complex molecular machines, and they were at the very beginning of the field. So the first molecular machine we made in Strasbourg is a catenane, and we called it a swinging catenane. Relatively simple. So what we have to, to know, uh, for those who are not uh, chemists, is that copper, the copper ion has basically two states. Copper one plus, uh, which is what we call the reduced state, and copper two plus, 
the oxidized state. Copper 1 plus is very happy when it is surrounded by four nitrogen atoms, like represented here, one, two, three, four nitrogen atoms arranged uh, in a tetrahedral uh, geometry. Copper 2 plus now is much more demanding. It wants to interact with five nitrogen atoms or even four or six nitrogen atoms. This is the only thing we have to keep in mind. Now we start from here, uh, where we have introduced a small fragment containing three nitrogen atoms. Copper, two, copper one plus, the black species, uh, forms a very stable complex here, so nothing moves. Everybody is perfectly happy. Now we will oxidize the system and generate copper two plus. Copper two plus, for the moment, is still surrounded by four nitrogen atoms. Is it happy or unhappy? What do you think? Very unhappy. Copper 2 wants to be five coordinated. And so the system will move because it will find a, a more comfortable situation if it moves. And the three nitrogen atoms which were here will kick out the two nitrogen atoms which were originally interacting, interacting with copper two, and at the end of the motion, you will obtain a very happy, very uh, smiley copper two. Five nitrogen atoms, copper two is perfectly happy. Once you're here, nothing moves anymore, but you can go back, you reduce, you inject an electron in the copper two center, generate copper one plus, and this time, copper one plus is very strongly destabilized so that the ring will glide again and you will regenerate, regenerate the starting form of the molecule. Uh, so this is a, a, a pirouetting motion. We call it a pirouetting motion or a swinging motion. Uh, it's not a real rotary motor because we have no control over the direction of the motion. And if you want to, to see real rotary motors, uh, uh, you have to look at uh, Ben Feringa's work, which started in 1999, um, and they made real rotary motor in an absolutely fantastic um, uh, work. Uh, but this, for the moment, is more an oscillating motor. I have a, an hopefully a nice video which shows what I just explained. We start from copper one, uh, we abstract an electron, we generate copper two, and the system will rearrange. The three nitrogen atoms will now interact with copper two, very stable, you can go back. Copper one, the system rearranges again, and you can do that as many times as you like. When I say as many times as you like, I mean in the computer, well, until it crashes. Um, but also you can do it as many times as you like with molecules. You know, the molecules are completely stable. Uh, we've never seen any degradation. We have never observed any uh, um, bad reaction. So you can really do that for uh, days and days and days. Just to show you that we improved the system quite significantly, at the beginning it was very, very slow. We were in the seconds to minutes time scale, and after maybe 10 or 12 years of work, uh, we could uh, reach uh, more interesting time scales in the micro to millisecond uh, time scale, in particular by um, pirouetting a ring uh, around an axis. Uh, so basically at the same time, our good friend Fraser Stoddart and uh, his group, uh, Ankel Kiefer, uh, a professor in, uh, in uh, Florida, and two postdoctoral researchers, they made what they called a molecular shuttle. So a ring can move from a green station to a red station. Uh, it can go back to the green station. So you send a signal, A, it goes 
again to the red station, another signal, B, and it comes back to the green station. And that was really very novel. And so this is the molecule they made, uh, which um, led to a molecular shuttle. And the, the blue ring here, which is uh, positively charged, so very strongly electron deficient, can move from a green station to a red station and come back to the green station. And so that was a very nice piece of work which led to important applications um, in a new field uh, which you can call molecular computing. So computing or storing information with uh, molecules. But we have no time to discuss that. <coughs> Let me show you uh, some uh, additional molecular machine from our work. Again, for, um, because of lack of time, uh, we have no time to enter the details of the, of the chemistry of the uh, molecule's uh, structure. But we made a molecule uh, similarly to this one, the same topology, so to say. And uh, we have two independent uh, units a pale blue unit and a dark blue unit, and you see that those two units are not connected by any covalent bond. It's a topological bond, if you like. And the, the, the axis, the pale blue axis, which threads the, 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 the dark blue ring is attached to a pale blue ring, which is threaded by the dark filament. And we could show that by using a chemical signal, uh, we could contract the system from eight nanometers to six nanometers and come back from six nanometers to eight nanometers, etc. And now it's a chemical signal. Uh, and uh, much more recently, uh, we have also um, been able to make a system uh, which is controlled by electron transfer. And electron transfer is of course more exciting, um, it is faster, it is cleaner than a chemical reaction. So let me finish up on our chemistry by uh, some um, uh, relatively recent uh, piece of work on molecular compressors. Now we will try to make a molecular compressor. And I explain you the reason why we became interested in molecular compressors. So there is a family of molecules in biology of enzymes, the chaperonins, or uh, chaperons, and these molecules have several functions, but one of their functions is in absolutely incredible. Um, it is to uh, encapsulate proteins which have been denatured. You know that enzymes, uh, which are proteins, after some time they start to denat denature uh, they are not infinitely stable, and they lose their active conformation. And instead of getting rid of, the, of them, uh, <coughs> the, in evolution, uh, the evolution found something which is much more clever, which is to fix them, to repair them. And once they have been denatured, those huge um, enzymes, uh, the chaperons, uh, have some cavity, and they fabricate some cavity, they can imprison the proteins, the denature proteins, do some massage on them, you know, uh, compress, pull, um, and uh, repair them. And once the proteins are in good shape, they are kicked out and they have to go back to work. You know, it's really fantastic, but uh, uh, in nature you find things which are beyond imagination. And we thought it would be nice and to make a molecular system which is able to compress smaller molecules. Of course, this is very, very naive uh, compared to the, the chaperons, uh, but uh, I will show you if, if we can, I don't know. Uh, so we, we had the, the project of ma making a compressor of this type. It's a four-rotaxane with uh, two axes here and two base microcycles. 
And the two beast microcycles contain central uh, plates, which are perfused. If you do not need any more, at some stage you tell me. And, uh, <laughs> and so we have two plates, which are perfused. And we, we, we can, well, we hope we will be able to insert some small molecule, a guest, in between those two plates. And hopefully, we will be able to bring those two plates to close proximity and compress the guest. This is the project. So that was the, uh, the target. Um, do you think it's a, an ambitious target or a, you should be able to make it within two weeks. So. <laughs> it's a very ambitious target. And the people in my group, you know, when they saw the, the target we had, uh, they told me, well, you're a bit nuts. You know, uh, we, we are not going to be able to make that. Uh, but we had lots and lots of discussions. And finally, you know, we, we started. And so you have here um, uh, a part of the hot axane, an axis, and two stoppers, the same here. And the two, I'm sorry, the two this microcycle, a ring, the connector, and a ring, the same here, a ring, and the long connector, and a ring, and the two plates, which we hope uh, we will be able to bring to closer proximity <coughs> at a later stage. So we could make it, I should say, reasonably easily, uh, because of symmetry. If you look, you know, it's a very symmetrical molecule. And uh, again, because of symmetry and because of the uh, magic effect of copper, of the template, the copper, the ion, which is able to gather all the fragments we need, maintain them in a given geometry, and allow the molecule to be finally synthetized. And we had an X-ray structure. That was really, you know, the cherry and the cake. We didn't expect to, to be able to crystallize the molecule, but we could crystallize it. It has a respectable molecular weight, you know, like a small protein. And uh, you can probably easily recognize the two porphyrins, which are here, and the two dumbbells, or the two axes, uh, which are white or almost white, and the two bis macrocycle, so one ring here and the other ring of the bis macrocycle and the second bis macrocycle. Very important, the four copper ions, the four copper ions are green, well, which is ridiculous because you know all these complexes are deep red or purple. So green, this is really not a good choice. Uh, but uh, so here are the, the four copper ions. And in a way, the four copper ions maintain the geometry in a very strictly controlled fashion. You know, they, are, they, const they const constitute some kind of scaffolding. You know, they maintain everything in a rigid way. And we have some space in between those two porphyrins, a distance of about 10 angstroms. And so we could introduce small molecules into the, in between those two porphyrins, uh, like um, a DAPCO or a bi, bipyridine, 4 4 prime bipyridine, or um, um, di, um, pyridyl methane, I mean, some small molecules in between. And uh, we thought for now it's time to uh, compress these molecules. And the idea was that if we remove the copper ions, the four copper ions, the system should completely modify its shape and compress the small molecule which is inserted between the two porphyrins. And it worked. Now we remove the coppers, and uh, you will see that uh, the, the geometry will be completely changed because this fragment wants to interact with the porphyrin. So it's uh, the molecule which is inside here in the cavity is um, slowly compressed or gradually compressed, compressed and compressed. And finally, of course, it is expelled. And if we put copper back in the system, we, we regenerate 
of course, exactly the same shape, the same um, recognition ability of the molecule to insert something in between those two plates, and we can again do it, remove the copper, etc. So this is um, just the conclusion on this part. Uh, we can uh, relatively easily compress something using a, a very naive uh, model of, uh, of the chapter, very naive. So let me <coughs> finish up. I mean, the scientific part is finished. I hope you're not too tired. Um, just to say that before the uh, emergence of the field uh, called molecular machines or molecular machines and motors, uh, synthetic molecules were considered as uh, steel objects, only moving in a random way. And of course, the work on uh, molecular machines <laughs> has completely changed the view of chemists and perhaps also of other scientific communities on molecules uh, which can now um, be, for some of them, considered as motors or machines, um, swinging catenanes and other things. Uh, so I was planning to talk about applications, but maybe we can keep that for questions if you are interested. Uh, I would like to also mention that um, what I spoke about was um, highly collective. Um, as you know, in experimental sciences, uh, the, the whole of the team is absolutely essential. And uh, my role was to be one of the members of the team. Uh, but uh, you know, many, many people had an extremely strong contribution uh, to the progress of this field, <coughs> especially uh, in France, it is, a, it is probably a bit similar uh, to the Spanish system with uh, CSIC. And uh, the CNRS uh, uh, you know, offers many positions for permanent researchers, at a, even at a very high level. And these people uh, have been working in our team uh, as uh, for some of them we were professors and some, other, some others were uh, research uh, directors, CNRS research directors. So I owe them a lot. Uh, we had many PhD students and postdocs uh, working on uh, uh, catenanes, rotaxanes, nuts, um, and um, many uh, postdocs. And that's something I already said yesterday, but I will say it again. We had a Spanish connection uh, Spanish connection with uh, Madrid and uh, Valencia, um, mostly. And um, the, the Spanish postdocs who work in my group were among the very best postdocs I ever worked with. And this is not because I'm here in Sevilla that I say that, uh, it's very, very sincere. And, and with many of them, we still have contact, they became friends. So it was an extremely positive uh, experience. Uh, so this, these are the people who made the, uh, the compressor. Uh, so also very talented people. And uh, I would like to thank my university, as usual, and the European Commission, uh, my new institute. I, I moved uh, from uh, an institute called Le Bel Institute in Strasbourg to ISIS. This is Jean-Marie Lane's institute after I had to retire from the CNRS. Uh, at the same time, I moved to Northwestern University in the US, uh, very close to Chicago. Uh, I thank my, my mentor, uh, some other people who had a very important influence, and my wife and our son, and uh, my two friends, Fraser Stoddart and Ben Feringa, those who won the, the Nobel Prize uh, with me. Uh, if I have one minute, maybe I can show you pictures of Stockholm. Yeah, you know, some people are interested in that, some others are not. Uh, but this is on uh, December 11, 2016. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the ceremony when you receive your Nobel Prize, uh, the ceremony takes place on uh, December uh, 10. 
every year, except when December 10 is a Sunday, and it will be on the Monday. Um, and it's very, very formal. Uh, so this, it takes place in the afternoon in a big uh, uh, city, is it the city hall or the, yeah, the city hall, uh, so Carmen, my wife's conference. This is the city hall, and you have many, many people. You have the royal family, and it is the, the king of Sweden, you know, who gives you uh, the medal and the certificate. Um, and everything is incredibly formal. And in the morning, you have to rehearse. You know, you have a, uh, a special session in the morning when everything is empty, and you have to learn. You know, you do three steps like this. Uh, you bend, you know, respect, uh, respectfully, and you, you go back, etc. I mean, it's very confusing, <laughs> and uh, it makes you feel very nervous. You know, at the beginning of the ceremony, and some of the of the laureates, a physicist, very nice chap, by the way. He was so confused that he did everything in the opposite way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so he bent to the public like this, <laughs> and uh, to the king in the same way. And so. But of course, everybody is in a good mood, you know, and the people were laughing. And uh, so these are the, my two <coughs> co-laureates, uh, Ben and uh, Fraser. And uh, we are very, very good friends, you know. And many people in the committees were surprised to see that we knew each other so well, and we were very close to each other, and, and they liked it, you know, because it's not always the same, uh, the same case. And Jean-Marie Lane, of course, uh, one of the great uh, scientists um, of uh, the last century, but also of this century, uh, was uh, um, part of the feast, uh, of the uh, celebration, um, and uh, this is Fraser Stoddard, and you see that Fraser Stoddard and uh, Carmen, my wife, is sitting there. Um, they got along very well, too. So we are friends for uh, more than 40 years. We know each other for more than 40 years, and even more 25 years ago, or 27 years ago, uh, we exchanged our kids. Um, our son went to the Stoddard to improve his level of English, and their second daughter, Alison, spent a couple of weeks in our family to improve her French, which she didn't do, actually, because we spoke in English. <laughs> uh, and I'm finished, so thank you very much. Thank you. is open for questions. There are no chemical bonds. There, there are chemical uh, bonds? No, there are no chemical bonds. This is the peptide itself. Yeah, the peptide, I mean, it forms a knot like this, so they, uh, but it doesn't close. Yeah. It doesn't close. I think. Oh, oh they, are, they are not closed. No, I, open. Yeah, I think they are not closed. Oh, yeah, or maybe with copper. Okay. You know, this is for some oxidase. Uh, uh, I mean, several of them are oxidase uh, enzymes and uh, they contain, for most of them, a copper ion. Okay. And probably the copper plays an important role, you know, in the noting. I see. No, no, yeah. but then now it's clear that it's open. The yeah, 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 open. yeah, yeah. No, no, it's open. Okay. I mean, in, you know, theoretically, yeah. uh, we shouldn't call them a knot, because a knot is a closed no, curve. I see. Okay. Yeah, but, but uh, you're bi a biologist, I assume? Yes, yeah. I, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> You know, they, I think they, they call them a knot, and everybody agrees. Yeah. Yeah. So if I have time for a second question, 
that means that that's part of your thought. Yeah, sure. I'm wondering, at the moment, how suitable are these molecules to, in terms of toxicity and stability yeah. to interact with these cells? Yeah. Um, well, this is a crucial question. I think there are very, very few studies, you know, uh, toxicity studies, which have been uh, carried out. Uh, but I can just tell you, you know, if, if I could continue my research, uh, that would be the next step, you know, to make molecular machines which would be biocompatible. And I think it's for the future, it's going to be a big challenge, you know, biocompatibility of those molecular machines and motors. Yeah. But for the moment, there is very little known. So the speed of these artificial motors are in the same range or a uh, different scale and yeah. how you can improve or reduce the speed of your, of your motors. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so in the, in the biological world, um, those molecular machines are incredibly fast. You know, they rotate extremely fast. ATP synthase uh, spins at about the, the rate of a Formula One engine. Uh, kinesin, if you, if you think of kinesin, you know, itself as having the size of a human being, um, it walks, I should say it runs on its rail, on the uh, microtubule, uh, at a speed of about uh, 300 kilometers an hour. So uh, nobody is able to run that fast. So the, the, the biological molecular machines are really amazingly efficient, amazingly fast, and uh, we are only at the beginning with uh, artificial molecular machines. And uh, <coughs> I think the, the most impressive molecular machines in terms of rate are those of Ben Feringa. You know, uh, Ben Feringa's machines are based on photochemistry. They are based on the isomerization of a CC double bond. So they shine light on the CC double bond and the system rearranges. And it can rearrange extremely fast, you know, on the, the microsecond and even below the microsecond uh, time scale. And our machines with uh, Fraser Stoddart and, and our group and other groups now, uh, they are not, you know, they do not move as fast, uh, but to reach the, let's say, micro, to millisecond time scale is uh, really nowadays kind of routine. Yeah. Another question? Oh, now it's very quiet, so you <laughs> should. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.